The women's liberation movement kicked off with a series of demonstrations organized by small groups who came to be known as radical feminists. As early as 1967, some women organized demonstrations and declared that they had nothing more to say to men. Bread and Roses, New York Radical Women and Red Stockings, among many other groups, determined to call attention to the oppression of women by direct action. Only by overthrowing male power that had so distorted society, in their view, could women empower themselves and achieve anything close to equality for women and social justice for women as well as men. To draw attention to their objections, they used direct action techniques, hexing bridal parties, for example, or publicly sharing the experiences of rape at speakouts instead of keeping silent about them. In March of 1970, radical women occupied the ladies' home journal offices. In a sit-in that lasted several days, they demanded daycare for employees and they asked that the male editor be replaced with a female who could speak more compassionately and empathetically to a female audience. But their most effective protest occurred at the 1968 Miss America pageant in Atlantic City, where about a hundred demonstrators called attention to the way women's bodies were depicted and exploited. They gathered together a heap of artifacts, they called them symbols of torture, and threw them into a freedom trash can. In went high-heeled shoes, hairspray, makeup, girdles and bras, all objects that symbolized women's efforts to please men. Protesters crowned a sheep with a Miss America crown and paraded her along the boardwalk to suggest that women were judged like animals. And though, despite the myth, they didn't burn any bras, they drew enough media attention to disturb contestants and organizers and to tarnish Miss America's image forever. These kinds of tactics drew widespread attention. Radical feminists excluded men from their demonstrations and called attention to their desire to live without male influence. Some called for safe spaces free from male influence. Others argued that heterosexuality turned women into dependents of men and insisted that women separate from men altogether. Briefly, in the early part of the 70s, radical women valorized lesbianism, convinced that a true feminist would have a female sexual partner as well as a female living partner a movement for lesbian separatism that took hold in the early part of the 1970s was briefly successful. Some, Marge Percy for example, proposed the then unthinkable idea of creating babies outside the womb. In vitro fertilization, of course, didn't begin until almost 20 years later. But Marge Percy thought that through parthenogenesis, women might shed their need for men even in the reproductive process. Perhaps the most significant actions of radical feminists occurred on behalf of reproductive rights. We know that the pill, distributed for the first time in 1961, enabled women to take control of their own reproductive schedule. Copper and hormonal IUDs, intrauterine devices, followed shortly thereafter. These two methods of birth control placed conception largely in women's hands. They encouraged the Boston Women's Health Collective to think about how women might take control of their own bodies more generally. In the late 1960s, the collective published first a pamphlet and then the book that some of us still know of as Our Bodies, Ourselves. The first edition appeared in 1970 and new editions have been in print ever since. Our Bodies Ourselves taught women how to recognize signs of physical problems and infections, to examine their own bodies, and to acknowledge normal feelings and experiences. 
Abortion, the final method of birth control, remained illegal in these early days of feminist protest. Arguing that women had a right to control their own bodies, radical feminists demanded its legalization. Beginning in the late 1960s, they undertook state campaigns for legal abortion that called attention to the dangers of women terminating their own pregnancies. The New York radical feminists, for example, joined with the Red Stockings in a 1969 action that became nationally famous. Traveling to the New York State Capitol in Albany, they protested the findings of a commission that rejected legalization. The commission consisted entirely of men, with the exception of one woman, and she a nun as the women said. In the early 1960s, a group of young women headquartered in Chicago had created something called the Jane Collective, an underground group that quietly, secretly informed women who needed abortions of where they could find safe and effective service. That service was sometimes provided by physicians and at others by specially trained lay people. In the four years between 1969, when the Jane Collective became generally known, and 1973, when abortion became legal throughout the United States, the Jane Collective and its many affiliates performed something like 11,000 abortions. Still, as the 70s opened, the crossed-out coat hanger reflected the negative feelings of women who determined that dangerous backroom abortions should give way to legal and healthy ways for women to terminate unwanted pregnancies. Roe v. Wade, the 1973 Supreme Court decision that finally decriminalized abortion, was yet to come.